Welcome to Off the Beaten Path. I am your host, Tadre Moignet, and I am here with Stella Atal of her namesake, Stella Atal. It is so good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thanks for hosting me. You have been doing this since 2007. That is when you opened your first studio, am I correct? Yes, when I launched my label. And I just found out about you last week. So I went to the French Ugandan fashion show and I was sitting in the second row and I saw your work come down the runway and I was literally captivated. Thank you. It's beautiful, it flows. What really struck me about your designs is that they are so elegant and yet distinctly African. It's not trying too hard. It's not trying too hard to be African. It's not trying too hard to be elegant. Everything just meshes together perfectly. Thank you so much. And then I was sitting next to another Ugandan designer and I was like, oh my God. And I was just thinking out loud. I said, look at those fabrics. And I said, I think they're hand painted. And she said, oh no, you can buy those like that. You can buy them in the market like that. And I was like, what? I don't think so. I was sitting so close, I could actually see that it was hand painted. And I'm thinking to myself, well, there's haters all over the world. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not haters, it's just uh, being uh, arrogant, ignorant, I mean, so. Okay. It's uh, being ignorant about the industry. You're gonna give her the benefit of the doubt. Okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> why not? There is a huge difference between what you're doing. I can literally see your brush strokes mm -hmm. versus some of the pieces that you can get at the market where it's like a katen, no, it's not katenge, but it's a lapa or it's just like a, what we would call a dira in Tanzania, mm -hmm. but it's printed. There's a huge difference between what you're doing and something that is printed. Yeah, actually people, tell the difference between the printed and the hand painted. I tried to hand print and they didn't like it. Oh, they want yes. something that is hand painted. I see. Because they see it as an original piece. Yes. And uh, mostly my pieces are bought by people who love art. Yes. So it's a piece of art. Some put them on, some hang them in their homes. So it's something that reminds you of the artist or reminds you of the places back home. It's wearable art. People home, yes. Now, you are a painter. You're a self-taught painter? No, I'm a professional painter and a self-taught designer. Designer. Yes. Okay, wonderful. So do you have someone helping you paint? No, I paint myself. You do the painting mm -hmm. yourself. Now, I did read that you come from a family of creatives. Yes, everyone at home is an artist. Okay, can you tell me what medium do your parents work in, do your siblings work in? Uh, actually, my mom was just a teacher. Okay. Actually, most of them are not practicing except one. But what does she like to do in her spare time? Does she sketch? Um, reading, being a teacher, she reads a lot. She reads a and lot. She used to sketch a lot. Okay. And um, my brothers also, they teach. Yes. Some teach music, some teach art, and um, I have my little children too. They're okay. painters, real, real painters. Yes. They love painting a lot. Every day they paint. You have two beautiful little girls. Well, they're not so little. Yes, <laughs> seven and fourteen. Yes, one's a teenager. Yes. And so, do they help you with your concepts, with your, with your designs? A lot, a lot. Uh, the big one loves fashion so much. She's a good painter, but loves fashion. So she's always sketching, mm -hmm. and she's good at graphics. She uses computers, so she'll do for you designs. Mm -hmm. And uh, while you're trying, because most of the time I do clothes, and I want to have a look at them before I decide on what to paint on. 
and then she'll come up with different designs. Let me try this, let me try that. And it's just, by the way, when I'm with them at home, it's really hard to work. But this one comes with a different version, the other and a different <laughs> version. Then when I'm painting, the little one wants to paint with me. Oh, so. wow. But you know, it's so good to have influence from young people mm -hmm. because they add freshness to your work. Exactly. There is a, there is a way they see my collection in their own version. And um, they, there is a certain kind of market they are trying to pull to attract my attention. They see the world differently. Exactly, yes. From how you and I would see it. Yeah. And then, you know, you can pull from that. Like, I like to stay abreast of what's happening in the world. How are millennials thinking? You know, and it helps me see, it helps me see my world differently. Because when you mature, you can become stagnant, you can become stuck in your ways, but how this will affect you as an artist is you're always fresh. You're yeah. always innovative when you have influence from younger people. Yeah, true, true, and they force you to work. They make you become so creative because you're trying to fight their imaginations. You're trying to compete with them. You know what you want, and they, they have something they want you to do. Yes. And they want you to do it and finish it and they want to set up. <laughs> They want it right away. <laughs> well, actually, when you see the other first outfit, the original piece of it wasn't like that. Really? But it was just the influence of my big daughter that ended up like that. Really? The first one I'll show you, it was just simple, very simple. Very simple. So how does she change that for you? She kept on putting it on. I was like, oh man, we have to change these colors. We take pictures. They didn't come out well in the pictures. Let's try this. Maybe they'll come out. I love that. So she puts on the outfit. We take pictures and we're like, no, this color didn't come out. Let's try this one. So we just keep changing colors, concepts, until we take pictures and say, yeah, that one will look nice on the runway. I love that. And I love that you come from a creative family. They supported you. I read that your brother would give you lessons. And your family yeah. so supported you. And now you're supporting your daughters. Yes, because uh, when I was growing up, I'm the third one. So I have two big brothers, and when I was growing up, they really had like a studio at home where they were painting from. And um, yes, I know I disturbed them, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> they saw I really wanted to learn. Yes. So they would teach me how to draw portraits, how to mix colors. Yes. They were really patient with me. <laughs> because sometimes when a painter, when you're in the studio, you really want to concentrate. You don't want anyone disturbing you. But uh, I'm glad they were there for me. I'm glad they were there for you, too. Yes. This wouldn't exist if they were not there for you. Exactly. Talk to me about your creative process. First is the fabrics. OK. I love fabrics. I collect fabrics. My house is full of fabrics everywhere. I just It's just something that comes up. Oh, when you tell me there's something happening, then I think I try to visualize the people in that area or in that country what would interest them the style the cards the colors and uh, slowly i start creating the collection but sometimes i sketch but i never follow my sketches really simply because every day i come up with a new idea so you get your inspiration from what's happening in the world, yeah. and then somehow you internalize that. Yeah. Maybe you sketch it out, but yeah. you start with the fabrics, and then from there you build with the colors. Exactly. Now, you were born in the northern part of Uganda, yes? yes. OK. And there's a lake there that you were born around this lake. Yeah. yeah how, do, how do you say it? Lake Kyoga. 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 Yes. <laughs> okay. But you were raised in Kampala. Yes. And so it looks like your work depicts everyday life in that region. Yes. I'm trying to teach the people who live in the cities, because most of them don't go to the villages. But then we're missing out on mm -hmm. our traditions, on our cultures. So these activities people in the villages do. And that's what portrays us as Ugandans. That's what we stand for. When you go abroad and they ask you to describe your culture, 
that is it. People in the villages, their daily lives from morning to sunset. What men do, what women do, what children do, and what they go through, the difficulties. Now, when I was researching mm -hmm. your work, I was on your Facebook page, and I went through some years, okay? I went through some years, mm -hmm. and I saw how each collection is very different. How would you say your style has evolved over the years? Um, I think um, the more you practice something, the more you get credit from people, the more you become creative. Because it gives you the energy to come up with something different from what you did yesterday. Though, most people say that when I started, they really want me to redo a collection from my last pieces. Yes. <laughs> one from each of them and then do a new collection because the first ones because I was young I had time I took a lot of time I concentrated putting beads painting doing this yes. they're more detailed if you look at them there was there was something I saw from one of your earlier collections and it was like they were very colorful um, it was almost like a tie-dye um, a lot of off-the-shoulder dresses, mm -hmm. those were lovely. Like, it just kind of reminded me of the Caribbean. And then you have this collection, mm -hmm. which, like I said, it's just so elegant and effortlessly African. So we talked about your daughters, mm -hmm. and we talked about how they've influenced you and they've influenced your work. Mm -hmm. How are you able to balance being a designer, mm -hmm. being a mother, and being a businesswoman? I've always been self-employed, so it's not something that uh, someone is forcing me to do. So I have to create time for everything. Of course, by the time you give birth, you make sure you have time for your children. And then you can leave business because, apart from being a business that earns me money, it's passion to me. So I have to create time for everything. But uh, like I said, my children are always part of my business. So they help me a lot. I may, I take it like it's now a family business because they help yes. me a lot. Do you think they'll go into fashion design? You never know. <laughs> <laughs> they may be active now, but then when they grow up, they want to be different. Like the big one wants to be a journalist. She's really good at everything, computing, art, fashion, but in her mind is somewhere else. Do you feel like you have balance? between your personal life and your professional life? And not really. And my professional life is taking more time from <laughs> my personal life. Yes, yes. Because sometimes you have to travel and you just feel so guilty that you don't have time for the children. You see them like a few days a week and then over the weekends because the shows are over the weekend. So Friday, Saturday, you leave home Friday, go back Monday morning. Mm. Sometimes you're there for just three days. Unpack, pack, take off. So Stella, you are the type of designer who is recognized around the world. You have been to the United States a few times. You've been to Europe, well, you live in Europe, you live in Paris, um, but you've been throughout Europe, of course, Africa and Asia as well. So I know that living in Paris, and now you're here in Uganda for two weeks, and we were talking about you leaving your daughters, and right now it's, it's school season. Yeah, it's school time. Yes, so I know that can be very strenuous. But you have family in Paris, no? Yes, actually, they are living. When I'm not there, I have grandparents. Their grandparents help me take care of them. Okay. Because they live next to me. Okay, great. And who doesn't love their grandparents? Oh, they spoil okay. you. Yes. Okay, sometimes now they're coming to realize that before they used to cry, but now they're like, oh, remember when I travel again? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Get to eat whatever you want to eat, exactly. go to bed when you want to go to bed, yes. And also the grandparents are so accommodative. They'll ask me, oh, what's your calendar like? We have shows where you're traveling to, so they do their programs according to my calendar. That's a blessing. Exactly. That is a blessing. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Mm. It would be so complicated. Yes. It is very complicated to work with children. Would you like to collaborate with other, with other artists? Yes, I've done that before. Okay. And definitely, why not? How so? How have you collaborated? I've worked um, with the Samsung. I don't know if you've met him. I have not. He's very creative. He's Ugandan. 
Is he men's wear or women's wear? Hot couture. Couture, okay. Yes. So he does he does it he all. Does everything but hot couture. Okay. And um, I've worked with, um, there is a time we had an EU fashion show here. And then we did a collab with um, designers from Europe. Okay, so when you collaborate, are you contributing the painting aspect? Are you also contributing uh, the cuts and the fabric as well? We sit down, get a concept, come up with the designs like in a group, all the two of us, and then we decide on which materials, and then just to make sure that it has a like your identity and my identity so we fuse the two identities together yes where do you source from your paints your fabrics the small accessories that you use where do you get those from uh, when i travel i make sure each country i go to first thing i have to go to their local market to see what is available which materials they have that are unique that I wouldn't, I wouldn't find in any other countries. That's why I said I collect a lot of fabrics. <laughs> Everywhere I go. Yes. At least I know my pocket money is for fabrics. Yes. I know what that's like. I used to, um, I used to design accessories, mm. but when the whole crochet thing was, was popping and mm. I had so much yarn, like, really specialty yarn mm -hmm. and it's like when am I ever going to use all of this stuff yeah. but you're so drawn to it because that's what you do yeah, exactly I'm just so attached to fabrics sometimes I feel guilty because you enter my house and it's full of fabrics <laughs> everywhere boxes and boxes but I bet it's beautiful exactly do you have any particular challenges as a woman designer an independent designer and an African designer. Yeah, definitely there are challenges. Uh, sometimes you get to the community and then the way they perceive you, they welcome you. Sometimes when you say I'm an African designer, before even they look at what you're doing, they're like, no. The fashion community? Yes, or even the public. Okay. Until they see what you're doing. Yes. Because I've had so many interviews in Paris. Yes. But then before you tell them, oh, I'm an African designer. I never think of the kangas, the Ankara fabrics. Yes, yes. Because we've, I think we've just made that identity that all African designers must use African fabrics. Right. But uh, when you show them what they do, when I show them what I do, they're like, oh wow, this is different. Exactly. So before, some of them won't want to listen because maybe they are just fed up. They've had a lot and they see it's still the same designers, so many designers, but you find us using same fabrics, there's no creativity, same cuts, some just copy and paste from the internet. So I Very true, uh, yeah. Very true. But also, um, like the marketing, yes, I live in Paris, but surprisingly, all my, most of my clients are in the U.S., in the U.K., other like surrounding countries. Really? Yeah. You don't have much of a market for your work in Paris. Not as much as I have in other countries for now. That's interesting. Yeah. Because maybe in Paris I'm more into training, and that's why I want to stop lectures and concentrate on training because that's where my passion is now. I did read that you have some sort of licensing now where you can open up your shop, you can teach if you want, you can sell however you want. Mm. Yes. Yeah, I've already started that with a workshop. So I'm training people from the communities or from the camps, the immigrants, and then also private people when they come and they want to learn how to sew, like simple, DIYs, I teach them. So for me, that's less hectic than co creating a collection. But you're not just a designer that creates, you're a designer that gives back to the community as well. Yes, I love that. Do you work with other young artists who want to create as well? Yeah, true, when I was still here, I had a workshop 
and my workshop was open to anyone who would want to come and try to learn how to use a machine. So people from my community, I was in Kamocha, and so many children would come in to learn how to sew. Nice, yeah. I love that. One of the things that a lot of independent designers say to me is they say that they have a problem with coming out with a new collection mm -hmm. and then competing with um, competing with the fast fashion, competing with the secondhand clothing. Mm -hmm. um, and I read that you uh, filed for a copyright for your work. Yes. How did that go? Please tell me about that situation. I love it. Actually, that was a copyright for art. It's very complicated to do a copyright for fashion because you just change maybe remove this or just change the stage, put a top stage and just a complete new design. But art, they have to dig into like the history of when you started painting, what your style is, comparing to the person who is copying you. It took, actually, it took four years. Four years? Yeah, so at one point I even regretted why. <laughs> And, but I you did. won. Yes, Someone. I did. I, I what did. made you start this copyright case? Because um, I saw artists being uh, exploited, and um, I thought I didn't do it for money, but I just wanted to show the public that you have to respect artists. Yes. If you want something, go order it from them. Don't take it to a cheap person to do it. But so I can't. It was a study. Case and a warning to the public that if you do it, you're going to you're going to end into trouble. Yes. Because I was the first one actually to do it in Uganda. I love it. <laughs> when I read that, I was like, okay, that's a smart woman. Have you ever thought about giving up, pursuing something else? No, never. Never. <laughs> what keeps you going? Um, it's my talent. I didn't pay for it, it's free. I got uh, knowledge from school. And I think going to start something else, when you've been employed, self-employed for years, I don't think it works out. And with my work, I work when I want. It's not that like every day I'm working, I can spend one week when I don't, I'm not in the mood of working and I will not work. I love or if I want to work, I'm going to work 24 hours, even in the night I'll work. So I think creative people are these people that cannot be employed. Because sometimes it's even hard to take orders, because you may <laughs> have orders, but you're not in the mood of working. And once yes. you're not in the mood of working, you're not going to do it. Yes. So oh, it's so complicated <laughs> to change. What would you say are some of your proudest moments? Hmm, there's been a lot. Yes. But um, I think one of them is um, when the lady from uh, Vogue Italia came to my workshop. I wasn't there, but she insisted she wanted to do an interview. Yes. Interviewed my manager on my behalf. Yes. And wrote an article, a very nice article in the magazine. Mm. And to me, that was really nice. That Someone is yummy. So, exactly. She was out there, she's big, and you know, like she's looking for this little thing in Africa. Vogue Italia. Mm. Tell me about some more of your triumphs. I want the people to know you've done so much. And then, uh, of course, being like invited, you know, the invitations I get from all the countries, some of them I don't even know the people. <laughs> and I have to go. By the way, so you get invitations, they're inviting you, they're paying for everything, you don't know them. So I have to go on the internet, read one by one to see what they're doing, yes. or I have to inquire. They're genuine, but then you wonder, how did they get to know me? And sometimes maybe one of them attended one of your shows and yes. liked it, or they've read about you, or someone has told them about you. I love this. I love it for two reasons, because number one, it's an example of how following your passions and sticking to what you really want to do can pay off in multiple ways. Like, I, I don't even like to use the word pay off because you, you receive stimulation and gratification from more ways than money. 
but I also like it because when I talk to a lot of designers, they say that fashion shows really don't make money for them, but for you, it works out. Yeah, I think the, the, uh, the chance I have is, um, I don't pay for shows. Most people pay for shows. Actually, okay. to participate in a show, you must pay. Okay. But because the organizers, people think that my style is different. It's like musicians. If you're organizing an event, if you want to make money, you must call an, uh, an artist you know who's going to sell. You're going to call maybe Chameleon, Platinum, because you know when people hear yes. she's coming, you're going to get a crowd. Gotcha. So it's the same as fashion. So they would pay for me to go because they know if they say I'm coming, people are going to come. Or the show will be successful. But in most cases, designers have to pay. And you can never get money out. I see. Because but my collection is eight outfits, period. But then some designers want to showcase 30, 20. I try to make eight, but outstanding. Yes. Yeah quality over quantity. Exactly. Now, I read in an article where you, you were telling younger designers mm -hmm. that they need to design in a way that is going to resonate with the public. Yeah. So if you could design mm -hmm. anything, mm -hmm. anything at all, without having to take into account whether or not someone would buy it, what would it be? Um, actually, talking about my work, I don't design for people. I really? do what I feel I love to do. So I would do, I, some people, yes, you have to look at the market. Of course, when I'm doing that uh, motivation talks, taking up uh, fashion as a business, you teach young designers how to come up with a collections with a um, like collections that are going to attract the market in, in which they live, where yes, they live. Yes. But for me, because for me it's art. It's more art than fashion. I do what I want. I want to <laughs> give it to the public and see how they perceive it. Freedom. Exactly. So I'm not on pressure to say, okay, I'm doing this for this. I do it and bring it out there. <laughs> so I test the market. I love that. I do my white collection during winter. Before I was actually intimidated before, and was in Europe, you have to follow the season, the color charts yes. and so on. I said, no, yeah, I'm going to be Stella. I do what I want, any time, any color. You want it, you buy it. You don't want it, you leave it. I understand, I understand. So you were raised here in Kampala and mm -hmm. uh, 2017 or 16? You moved to France? 16. Okay, so you've only been there for a couple of years, yeah, for about three years. years. Oh, yes. And you got the licensing that you needed. You've been around the world yes. um, just doing what you do. Mm -hmm. If there was any place in the world mm -hmm. that you could be, mm -hmm. just be, where would it be? Home. <laughs> really? <laughs> Uganda, yes. So if you could return back to Kampala, mm -hmm. or would, would you go up north? Um, because I uh, work a lot with the communities, I wouldn't say I live in the north, but I would love to see myself help different communities around my country. Because I'm not in Paris to stay, I'm just there to see how we can change the fashion industry here. Borrow from those people, and then try to come and make sure that we change everything here, the way things work here in the fashion industry. I was speaking to another designer mm -hmm. um, off record, mm -hmm. <laughs> and he was telling me about how the secondhand market devalues what he's doing. And he was saying that the East African community got together mm -hmm. and they basically tried to limit the amount of secondhand clothing that was coming into Uganda. Mm -hmm. For those of my viewers out there who are not familiar, the secondhand market in Africa is really intense. 
So the things that people discard in the United States and Europe, the best pieces stay in Europe and, and in the United States. Next, they'll come to Africa or Asia. And you know, you're able to find really affordable pieces here for someone who doesn't make a lot of money. But if you are a burgeoning designer, it really can affect your bottom line. And then apparently I was told that the United States government pushed back and said if you, you know, basically there will be repercussions. Yes, yes, if you stop this. Yeah. I didn't know it was such a huge market. Yeah, it is, but um, it, that happened, but um, I don't have a lot of problem with the second-hand clothes. Okay. I have a problem with the Chinese clothes. The fast because fashion. With a, yes, with the second-hand clothes, we can recycle them. Yes. Because if you think they're cheap, I've done a collection. I did, I went and got designer clothes in the second-hand market, cheap. Because at least you know the quality of the material is good. Yes. You're going to recycle it and do something new. Yes. Which you can't do with a Chinese outfit. So That's a very good point. Anything, if they are to ban anything, it has to be Chinese clothes. Mm. Well, you know that's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, that is what this designer was doing. He was buying the secondhand mm. cottons and linens, mm. washing them, um, exactly. taking them apart, and then creating wonderful collections. Exactly, because with the secondhand clothes, you're going to buy it for 1000 and I'm going to take the nice buttons out of it. I'm going to take the nice zip out of it. So if it doesn't work out to burn the secondhand clothes, we can still recycle them, we can make good use of them, make something new, but we don't want Chinese clothes. It's a problem in the States as well. You know, we have H&M, we have Forever 21, and you know, just talking with my dad about growing up, and he would talk about how you know, this is the state. So when he was coming up, they would put clothes on layaway and the clothes were made of wool and they didn't have many man-made fabrics. Um, and then today in the United States, it's difficult to find reasonably priced quality made clothing. Yes. And I worked in retail and I just watched the decline mm -hmm. in the quality of the fabrics, yes. especially after 2008 when our market fell. Yeah, yeah. same in Paris. Mm. You either buy the most expensive one or you buy the cheap one. Yeah. Because it's either Chinese or... But you know the challenge is because even the top designers are doing their productions in China. So they will do the best quality and then they may get the same and do the cheapest. Right. So we're in between, now as designers, we're in between. Yes. That's why most people are now coming up to appreciate us, and they know once I make something for them, it's going to last for them years. I started in 2007, and I still have my clients from then on. That's beautiful. They still have the clothes I made in 2007. Yes, that's wonderful. You don't, you're not looking at a big market, but you're looking at those clients that are going to appreciate and keep supporting you. Yes. Stella Atal. Yes. Who are you at your core? I'm a self-made fashion designer and a professional artist, and a mother, a parent, and someone who loves to help the community. Have you had difficulty working with men? No, actually, no. I love working with men. Really? I love working with men. I think they understand me more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Who do you want to be when you grow up? Myself. I love that. Oh, yes. I, somehow I knew you were going to say that. Like, I am who I want to be. I yes. love that. Mm -hmm. I want to be myself. Other people look up to you're that person. Yes. You are that person. Thank you. True to yourself. Thank you. Yes. What would you tell your younger self? Believe in yourself. Don't mind about what other people say. Don't let anyone shadow you. Be the shadow to your future or to your imaginations. Just go out there, try out something, let it out to the public and let them 
charge you, like being charged. Do you feel like that was a problem for you and, or an issue for you when you first started out? Um, no, because um, like I said, I didn't do what people want me to do. I did what I want. So those who saw what I'm doing interesting and eye-catching, they followed me. Every time you try to do what people want you to do, you're being squeezed in a box. Yes. You get out of the box, tell them, this is me, this is what I do, I can't change. You see people following you. And people either accept it or they don't. Exactly. You find those who don't accept, those who accept. So you, those who follow you, those who accept, they'll follow you. Like I said, it's a market. You know, like you have a lot to choose from. There's a lot, there's a lot, so many designers. Yes. So you choose who you want, which style you want. You may buy a shoe from one designer, you buy earrings from another, dress from me. What do you tell your daughters? Follow their dreams. Because you've had a challenge where parents force children. They try to live the dreams of their children. Yes. And in the end, they've wasted their money educating these children in the direction where they want. And then the children have wasted their time trying to be those good followers of their parents. Yes. So if a child tells you, I want to sing at three, I've seen a child here singing at seven, let them go and sing. Mm -hmm. Why do you put someone in a mathematics class when their interest is singing? Yes. You're wasting their time, you're wasting your money. Exactly. And then you're denying them a chance to explore to open up yes. and give the public what they have inside them. Well, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful interview. Thank you so much for hosting me. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Off the Beaten Path with Stella Atal. Join us on the next episode where we take you to one of her favorite places in Kampala, Uganda. <laughs>